to Reading on the Rock. Good evening, friends, and welcome to Reading on the Rock at Covenant United Methodist Church. I'm Reverend Ann Kemper. Tonight, we're continuing our series of books highlighting Black History Month. And tonight, Jeremy Smith, director of Freedom Scholars, will read a story about Frederick Douglass's early years and how learning to read led him to freedom. My name is Jeremy Smith. I am the executive director of Freedom Scholars Learning Center Incorporated. And today's reading will be from the book, Words Set Me Free. And it's about the inspiring story of young Frederick Douglass. It is written by Lisa Celine Ransom and illustrated by James E. Ransom. And the publisher of this text is from Simon and Schuster Books for Young Readers. My mama was named Harriet Bailey. They say my master, Captain Aaron Anthony, was my daddy. After I was born, they sent me to my grandmama and my mama to another plantation. But when she could, she walked the 12 miles in the middle of the night to come to see me. It must have been a long walk, because by the time she got there, she was too tired to talk. I remember she would just sit on a dirt floor near my pallet, watching me. I never saw her face in the light of day. In the morning, she'd be gone. Sometimes I wondered if I had only dreamed she was by my side her rough hands gently stroking my face. When I was still young, Cook told me my mama too sick. I never saw her again. I lived with Grandmama Betsy in her cabin until our master told her to bring me up to the big house on what we call Great House Farm. Grandmama went back to her cabin, but I stayed behind with the other slave children. I was just six years old. Much of my time was my own, as I was not yet old enough to work the fields. We ate our two meals a day out of a trough, just like the animals in the barn. We were always hungry, so we shoved down our meals of cornmeal mush with shells and dirty hands but even the animals were rested in the heat of the afternoon sun, and they were never whipped bloody for being too tired or too sick or too slow. At eight years old, my mistress told me I was leaving the plantation to go to another master, her brother-in-law in Baltimore. Master rented me out to make extra money. I could not imagine a life beyond my plantation. From Cousin Tom, an older slave on the plantation who had once been to Baltimore, he told me of a city so big and pretty, it seemed like a thousand great house farms. On a Saturday, when we sailed down the Miles River with all I owned in the world, my first pair of scratchy breeches and a shift, I did not cry. I was ready to leave Talbot County, Maryland, behind. We arrived at Smith's Wharf on Sunday morning. Old Tom never told me that Baltimore looked as if it floated on a sea of waves. At the Aliciana Street home of my new master, Hugh Auld, his wife, Sophia, opened the door and greeted me. Mrs. was small, not much bigger than me, and she had the first friendly white face I had ever seen. It took us a while to get used to each other. She had never owned slaves, and I have never been treated like a paid servant. I was glad no one ever told me that there's a big difference between the servants you pay and the slave you own. During the day, I ran errands for my master. In the evenings, Mrs. sat by the fire and read the Bible aloud. Her kindly smile and voice warmed me as I entered the room. I do not know why, but I asked her to teach me to read. On that night, she took me directly into her library, pulled out the first book she saw, and set me down next to her. 
We started with the letter A, and she continued from there. The letters felt strange on my lips. As I read, I remembered hearing of a boy back in a plantation who had his thumb chopped off when he was caught reading, and the letters I was reciting got caught in my throat. I remembered my old master's words when he gathered all of us slaves together to announce anyone caught trying to read will be whipped. And my mouth was dry. Every day, she gave me more letters to learn until I knew I had the whole alphabet and a few words memorized. She promised me that soon I would be able to read the Bible on my own. I wanted to read for myself where in the Bible it said one man should own another. But before that could happen, he found out. I couldn't blame her. Mrs. was so proud. She taught me all of my letters in such a short time that she told her husband so. I thought he was going to whip me right there, but his words hurt worse than any lashings. He should know nothing but to obey his master, to do as he is told to do, he shouted, and my mistress looked away ashamed. If you teach him how to read, there will be no keeping him. It will forever unfit him to be a slave. I may not have known how to read, but I knew that if learning made me no longer want to be a slave, then I will secure my freedom one letter at a time. She locked the door to the library and hid away the newspapers. She watched me all the time to make sure I was not putting together any more of those letters she had taught me. I knew she wished she could take it all back, but it was too late. With the brick and the lump of chalk was first how I practiced my letters. Stretched them along the brick streets and wooden fences of Baltimore. P looked like a cell on one of the ships. L was a leg with a big foot. Two sticks crossed in the middle. That was X. There was plenty of food in Master Old's house. Food enough to share. I started to bring along some bread in case some of the white children from the neighborhood needed convincing. They did not have much, so for just a piece of bread, I dared them to write letters better than me. What they wrote, I copied. I told them my name. Let me see you try it, I said. Fast as I could, I ran to complete all of my errands for my missus. Then me and my friends would get to work on my writing. Roll in the seat of my breeches was where I kept my copy book. Mine, now that I look, took it from Master's son, Thomas. Even though he was only six, Mrs. said he learned his letters a year ago. He was reading now. While I ran through the wharves and narrow streets of Baltimore, I was reading. The words the ship carpenters scribbled on timbers and masts, the names of shops and streets, headlines from the newspapers held in a new boy's hand. I kept all those words in my head and copied them into my book when I got a chance. As I ran, I could almost feel myself free, run into a home where no man called himself a master of another. Sometimes, before I returned, I stood on the docks watching the ships, free to go as they pleased. At 12 years old, with tips I saved for my errands, I bought my first newspaper and learned new words, liberty, justice, and freedom. Abolition was the word the newspaper used when they called for ending slavery. These were the words my master would never want me to see. Now that I was reading about Negroes in the North, free from the burden of slavery, it was as if someone had lit a candle to my world. I saw freedom everywhere I looked, and the hope of it was what kept me alive. For seven years, I worked for my master and his missus down at the shipyard, lifting and laboring, and back at their homes, toting and hauling, always pretending to be something I was not, content to be a slave. When my old master, Captain Anthony, died, I had to return to the great house farm to be divided up with the rest of his property, along with the sheep, 
the horses, and the swine. Great House Farm remained the same. Hunger, weariness, and sadness seeped into the souls of every slave. The boy who returned to his birthplace was not the same one who had left years earlier. That young boy was replaced with a 15-year-old who was free on the inside, but not yet free on the outside. Though my copy books and newspapers were long gone, words comforted me in the field as I chopped cotton from sunup to sundown. And words lay down with me at night. When my body ached with pain and hunger, I knew that the words would put an end to my suffering. I just wasn't sure when and how. I was hired out to work for Mr. William Freeland, and while he was kinder than most, he was still a man who believed it was his divine right to own another human being. Since my return to Talbot County, I became friends with Henry John and Handy, and I often spoke of my years in Baltimore. When I first told them I had learned to read, they stopped short and looked around to see if anyone else was nearby. They asked me to teach them, and I did. That's how I knew I could trust them. From then on, I thought I would devote my Sundays to teaching these, my loved fellow slaves, how to read. At first, we had school among the trees. Me stretching out letters and words in the dirt with a stick. John caught on fast, and he helped me teach the others. They never missed a Sunday. Sometimes they brought others who then brought others. We had a school before long, but as far as the master knew, we were having church. Sitting on rocks and stumps and tired from the week's work, we sang out the alphabet like we sang out spirituals. Those of us who could read from the Bible. We were doing God's work. During one of our services, I got the idea for how I could run. Someone mentioned they knew where Master kept his papers and quills, and did I think we could use them. At first, I said no. We needed nothing from Master. But then I started thinking. First, I approached John, and then three others decided to join us in our escape. We would steal a boat from the neighboring Hamilton farm and make our way in the night to the Chesapeake Bay. From there, we will follow the North Star. Epilogue. Eight years had passed since I was sat in the library of Mrs. Auld learning my letters, and eight years still since Master Auld had issued the warning to his wife. It was the only time in my life when I agreed with my master. I was now unfit to be a slave. Just before Easter, with a fine quill and paper secured by one of the house slaves, I wrote in a firm and steady hand. This is to certify that I, the undersigned, to have given the bearer, my servant, Frederick Bailey, full liberty to go to Baltimore to spend the Easter holidays. Written with my own hand, B.C. 1835. William Hamilton, near St. Michael's, in Talbot County, Maryland. I also knew that somehow words would set me free, but words on paper were now going to let me walk right out of Talbot County and into freedom up north. So today's reading, Words Set Me Free, the story of young Frederick Douglass was impactful, inspiring, and more than anything, motivating. I think understanding the importance of words and how words play a key role in not just defining us, but also help creating paths to find success successful solutions that we may need for whatever we're struggling with in life. His ability to understand that linguistic capital was something that he had to spend a lot of time in to understand how to free himself was something that I think a lot of our kids struggle with today. So a book like this will inspire and motivate children to understand the importance of words and how words can set you free. So without further ado, I will say that this book is definitely a book that we would love to have in every child's home um, in Rochester because of the connection with Frederick Douglass and his actual uh, connection to Rochester. And knowing that his story started in the South, 
but his freedom began in the North and it happened right here in Rochester, New York. Thank you, Jeremy. What a wonderful story, very encouraging. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for people like Frederick Douglass, for their, his inspiring story of how the love of reading can change lives. Amen. Join us next week as we conclude our series on Black History Month. Good night. Reading on the Rock is presented by Covenant United Methodist Church in Rochester, New York. If you like Reading on the Rock, please give a donation on our website, covenantroc.org.